Hi everyone, I'm Josh. I'm Open Force Field Science Communicator. Today I'm going to take you through eight Jupyter Notebooks that explore some features of our tools that we're really excited about. These features are in various states of readiness. Before each notebook, I'll give them a traffic light color to explain where we're up to. Green means it's ready to go, yellow means it works but it might have significant bugs or uncertain scientific validity, and red denotes a highly experimental feature that is likely to break but reflects something really exciting in the future. The first thing I want to do is describe how to run a basic simulation with OpenFF tools. This is green. This is our recommended method for running a protein ligand system. The only trick is that we're combining the Sage force field with uh, the Amber protein force field. This notebook is uh, simplified down from the toolkit showcase, which goes into a lot more detail about how this works. But we just need to go over how to run a basic simulation because we'll be doing that in almost every one of the notebooks that we're coming up to. The first cell just describes what we're doing in the OpenFF world itself. First, we create a molecule. A molecule is an in-memory representation of a particular chemistry. So this doesn't necessarily have a model applied to it. It's just the idea of this molecule. Then we create a topology. A topology is, again, an in-memory representation of the idea of a, a simulation box. So again, no force field, just a whole bunch of molecules uh, with periodic boundary conditions and coordinates. Now, we load this topology from a PDB file. Because we want to be really careful about making sure we always know exactly what the chemistry is in our topologies, and because PDBs don't represent chemistry very clearly, we require this unique molecules argument for any molecules that the toolkit doesn't know how to read out of the box. So in other words, anything apart from water, a few monovalent ions, and protein. So in particular, the ligand in this protein ligand system needs to be expressed to the function. PDB has all explicit hydrogens, and it has connect records for every bond, but the bond orders and partial charges need to be taken from a molecule. They can't be inferred from the PDB. Lastly, this FF defines an actual force field. Here we're combining the latest SAGE force field with protein parameters from AMBER FF14SB. These are both Shimonov force fields. Uh, we've sequenced it so that our general parameters are up first and our more specific parameters are later. Uh, those more specific parameters will apply when they can, and when they don't apply, we'll fall back to Sage. Finally, we use the force field to create an interchange out of the topology. An interchange is an object that represents a parameterized simulation system and can then be exported to input files for a whole range of MD engines, and then we visualize it. So there we're done. Uh, we can see this in 3D using NGL view. Uh, and this just takes a minute because most of that time is in generating partial charges uh, for, for the molecule, which is done by running a DFT calculation. Okay, so once we have our interchange, we can then use it to produce an OpenMM simulation. So this is one of the output formats that Interchange can produce. We give it an integrator, and then it uh, produces everything else needed to run a simulation. We're going to energy minimize that simulation, create a reporter that will record the trajectory every thousand steps for us, set velocities to the temperature of the integrator, and then run the simulation for a minute. We're using OpenMM because it works really nicely in a Jupyter Notebook. OpenMM's whole interface is just Python, so being able to natively represent that in a Jupyter Notebook is very convenient. So there we are done. We've run our simulation for a minute, and now we can use NGLView again to actually visualize that uh, simulation. So here's our simulation system. Uh, we can see uh, the protein and then the ligand inside it. And if we run it, we can see it wiggle as we'd expect for a short simulation. Okay, great. So keep that pattern in mind because we'll use it over and over again in our other notebooks. This notebook is green, it's ready to go. 
Virtual sites are ready from a tooling perspective, but we haven't yet published a force field that uses them. A virtual site is just an interaction site that is produced by the force field rather than being included in the model. So it's an interaction site that doesn't correspond to an atom. They're used to represent lone pairs uh, and other chemistry that isn't centered on an atomic nucleus. Virtual sites in open force field are entirely features of the force field. We give the force field exactly the chemistry we want it to simulate, and it's the force field's job to figure out how to actually model that and whether the modeling wants to include things like virtual sites. So this force field uses SAGE uh, as general parameters, and then we have some example virtual sites uh, that I'm just using to explain how these virtual sites work. Just to show you that this isn't anything complicated, uh, this virtual sites force field is just designed to demonstrate each virtual site type uh, without actually writing down any parameters that might be confused for something that's actually meaningful. So if you're familiar with Schmernoff force fields, you can see that the virtual sites just form another parameter section, and then each section within has a smirks pattern to describe the chemistry as usual, and then some configuration values for positioning the charge, and then some physical values for parameterizing it. Okay, so we're going to load that force field on top of Sage so that we can run this on some real chemistry. The virtual sites won't do anything, but they'll demonstrate the geometry. And then we've got a cell that just includes some functions that let us visualize the virtual sites. Okay, the first virtual site is a bond charge virtual site. This just places a virtual site some distance away from an atom in the direction of a bond defined between that atom and a second atom. So we can have a look at the attributes of that virtual site. And we can see there's a smirks pattern that defines two atoms. And then we ask for a bond charge type virtual site, and we specify a distance of 1.5 angstroms. And if we look at what that looks like, we see here's our chlorine, the carbon that it's bonded to, and then the virtual site here, 1.5 angstroms away. And we can see when we simulate it, it remains exactly that distance along exactly that geometry, because that's how virtual sites work. After our bond charge virtual site, we have a monovalent lone pair virtual site. So this is a virtual site designed to represent a lone pair in a monovalent atom, like a carbonyl. The virtual site is defined by three atoms. Those three atoms define a plane. And then the new virtual site is placed some distance away from the last atom at an angle defined against that plane. So this allows us to put two virtual sites on the same atom uh, and they'll be above and below the plane of these three atoms. So we can see here we have a Schmirks pattern that describes an oxygen to which the lone pair applies, which is then double bonded to a carbon and then any atom as the third part of the Smirks pattern. And so these three atoms define that plane. We've asked for all permutations, which means instead of just placing one site, we'll place as many as we can. And we've asked to place that a distance half an angstrom away. We've asked to place the two lone pairs in the plane of three specified atoms uh, and offset by an angle of 110 degrees. So if we visualize that, we see here's our two lone pairs and we can run it and see that they remain in the plane defined by these three atoms. And as the molecule moves, the virtual sites move with it. Okay. Next, we have a divalent lone pair virtual site which is used for four and five point water models. And in this, the three atoms that define the plane include a central atom and then two atoms connected to that atom. So instead of the plane being the first atom, the atom alpha to it and an atom beta to it, they're two atoms alpha to it. Okay, so we can look at these parameters and we can see that uh, these parameters actually have some charges, and that's because this is taken from tip 4p, as we can see here. So 
uh, a much smaller distance and we match only once. So because it's a four point water model, we represent the two lone pairs with a single interaction site. Okay, and we can have a look at that. And we can see there's our interaction site slightly off center from the oxygen atom. And we can look at tip 5p as well, five point water model that uses all permutations to represent two lone pairs. If we have a look at that, we can see that we have the two lone pairs. The last type of virtual site is a trivalent lone pair virtual site. You probably can guess this by now. We now have three substituent atoms from the atom upon which the virtual site is based. Uh, and in this case, the virtual site is placed perpendicular to the plane defined by the three alpha atoms. So the atoms two, three, and four. Uh, so if we have a look at our trivalent lone pair, um, we can see that we're not using the in and out of plane angles for this lone pair. That's what this none means. It doesn't mean that you could use this, but we're not going to. If you did meant that, you would say zero degrees. But what it means is that these two angles don't apply to this lone pair. So we're now just placing a lone pair one angstrom away from a, an amine nitrogen. And we can run that and we can see what it looks like. Okay. Now, having a single virtual site is useful, but having complicated molecules that can have multiple virtual sites is also totally fine. So we can just choose this much more complicated molecule, lots of chlorines, uh, nitrogens, all sorts of fun things. And when we look at it, all of those virtual sites are added without any dramas at all. Okay, that's virtual sites. One of the toolkit's features is that it can import molecules from the RD kit and also from other toolkits like OpenEye. This means that if you're familiar with RD kit, you can do all sorts of fancy chemistry in RD kit world and then pull it back into open force field and apply a force field to it and do some molecular mechanics on it. So we're going to demonstrate this with RD kit. Basically what we're going to do is take that simulation system from the first notebook and then mutate each of the hydrogens to a halogen and then run all of those simulations one after the other. This is another green notebook. Everything we'll use here has been in open force field for ages and works really well. So this first cell looks very familiar. We're just loading that topology and force field as we did before. And we can visualize it if you don't remember what it looks like. So this is the molecule we're going to transform. And now we use RD kits reaction handling to mutate each aliphatic carbon hydrogen bond to carbon fluoride. Uh, so that's what this says. Take carbon hydrogen, convert it to carbon fluorine. The hydrogen has the same index as the fluorine, which means that the fluorine will go in the same place as the hydrogen. Then we need to trim out any duplicate molecules sanitize them and convert them back to OpenFF molecules. So we can see here, we first created an OpenFF molecule, converted it to RD kit, run a whole bunch of RD kit processes on it, and then converting it back from RD kit into OpenFF. OpenFF's rules about what a molecule is are a lot more strict than RD kit. So we insist that there are no implicit hydrogens, and that we don't have any dangling bonds or radicals because we don't want people to accidentally apply parameters where they don't make sense. And we found that having these strict rules makes it a lot easier to be confident in the results that you're producing. Okay, so now we'll have all of our modified molecules and we can display them in a grid. So here we see each of these has a different hydrogen replaced with fluorine. Note that this one is looks similar to this one, but it's the opposite stereochemistry. And the chemically equivalent hydrogens and the aryl hydrogens have been skipped, just as we wanted. 
Okay, so now we simply iterate over all of those products that we want to simulate, create a new topology from the original topologies molecules plus the new one, skipping the original ligand, copy over the box vectors, and then create an interchange, minimize, and simulate uh, in the usual way. This will take a couple of minutes because we're running a lot of different simulations. Uh, a common question at this point is, where are we getting the new coordinates for our changed molecules? And the answer is, since we're just changing one atom at a time, we can just allow the molecular mechanics energy minimization to correct the bonds. If you wanted to make more dramatic changes to your input molecule, you'd obviously have to come up with a more sophisticated method for developing those new coordinates. Okay, so now that that's all done, we can visualize them. So this just works, you pick the simulation you want to visualize, and then it'll run it in NGLview. Uh, and so we can see, here's our molecule, and it wiggles. This next notebook is about OpenFF QC submit. This is a green notebook. This is all features that have been well in place for a long time, but we haven't really talked about them as much as we could, and we think they're, they're quite useful. QC submit is a third party interface to QC fractal. QC fractal is a database of quantum chemistry calculations run all around the world and available. Uh, online. So QC Fractal is the software, and a particular instance is things like QC Archive. Um, we needed a tool for collecting large data sets and filtering them for parameterizing force fields, and so we came up with OpenFF QC Submit. So we're just going to skip any warnings so we don't have to worry about them. The first thing we're going to do is create a client of QC Portal. So uh, this will talk to QC Archive and say, hey, I want to download some things in a moment. Then we're going to query the archive for a particular data set. So we are asking to create a new result collection from the client we've just caused, and we're searching for uh, this data set and this spec name. So this is now asking the server, do you have any data sets by this name? And it is downloading that metadata, but it's not downloading the actual results themselves, just the, the record of what happened, the metadata of the, the result. So now that we have that result collection, uh, we can have a look at uh, what's in it. And we can see it has 23 results and 23 molecules. So each of these results is a different molecule. And these results include an entire torsion drive. And we can look at the first 10 entries and see that each of them is a torsion drive. Uh, they have the smiles with all of the uh, atom indexes so that we know what order they're in. Uh, and they say that it's a torsion. Right. So now we want to actually pull down the actual records of the results, the actual uh, data that, that has been collected. The first thing we usually want to do when we want that is to filter them. So we don't necessarily want all 23 results. Uh, we might just want one or two. And in this case, we're just going to ask for uh, any results that involve a thiol group. So in other words, we're looking for the cysteine. So there's a whole bunch of filters like this. Uh, you can filter down as much as you want to just get the results that you actually want. And this is more useful in very large data sets, but it's useful here too. So we now filtered this down to a single entry and we can then download uh, that result. Okay. And now we have that record of the entire torsion drive. Uh, there's a lot of data here, a lot of uh, energies of all the coordinates. 
Um, so this is a two-dimensional torsion drive, and these are the energies of uh, each pair of coordinates. And we can now look at it. What we're doing here is we're organizing all of that information into bins according to the phi and psi coordinates, and then we can plot those bins using Plotly. And Plotly is quite cool because it lets you write interactivity quite easily. So we can see this is basically a Ramachandran plot. Um, here's our uh, cysteine in the middle of an amino acid chain. And in fact, if I click on a particular bin, this is that coordinate. If I look at this peak, this one is the one that's particularly unhappy, presumably because of this clash. So this doesn't take that much effort to write. Uh, you just sort of say, whenever I click, I want to make this transformation. You need to be able to convert from where it's clicked to uh, what the actual frame you want is. But the point is that this is extremely flexible. There are all sorts of things you can write here. And this makes it really nice and easy to visually inspect exactly what's going on. So this is just another great advantage of Jupyter Notebooks. This notebook is also green. This notebook is about vectorized interchange representations. So interchange, as we've talked about, is a piece of software for parameterizing molecular simulations and then exporting them to all sorts of different engines. So as part of that, it has to store a representation of all the parameters applied to a system. And it does that in a way that doesn't duplicate any parameter. So if you have a single parameter that's applied more than once to a system, Interchange will just remember one copy of that parameter and point to it from multiple places in the topology. We think this is exciting for novel optimization techniques for force fields, because we can just modify an interchange and then directly run it and simulate it and keep a track of where all those force field parameters came from. And so we can keep a track of what smirks parameters uh, gave rise to what force field parameters. And one of the ways we can do this with interchange is through a vectorized representation. So interchange supports representing all of its parameters as matrices that can be multiplied together. And we think this might be interesting for people working on ML techniques, so they can get an entire force field in a matrix representation, export it in a newly optimized matrix representation, and then just import that matrix directly into interchange. This is a green notebook. Everything works, uh, and feel free to experiment with this if you're excited about it. Okay, I'm gonna load some stuff and then load difluoroethene into uh, the interchange and then apply the Sage force field to it. We can see uh, that we have a number of collections associated with this interchange, and we can visualize it. So this is our molecule that we'll be having a look at. We're going to have a look at the bonds collection. A collection is all of the parameters of a certain sort in an interchange. So it associates a particular functional form with various parameters that use that functional form. So we can have a look at all of the parameters that are in this interchange. Uh, and so there are three different kinds of bonds in this interchange. Uh, on the left, we have force constants, and on the right, we have bond lengths. So we can see. There's one bond for this double bond, one bond for carbon fluorine bond, and one bond for a carbon hydrogen bond. And then these two bonds and these two bonds share parameters. So this is the force field parameters. So all the parameters in the force field that have been applied to this molecule. But system parameters is a bit different. System parameters has a line instead of for each parameter, it has a line for each actual instance of this parameter. So we can now see that there are six bonds total. Two of them share an energy of 772 kilocalories per square angstrom. And two of them share 710 and a half. And then there's one last with 904. And then the map between these two matrices is the param matrix. So here, the first row is the force constant in the first bond. Second row is the bond distance in the first bond, the third row is the force constant in the second bond, and so on. So each pair of rows defines a bond. The position of the one indicates the position of the parameter in the force field parameters matrix that has been flattened. And so what this means 
is if we multiply the parameter matrix by the flattened force field parameters, we will get the system parameters. And you can see that here. And so this gives you a whole bunch of matrices that can be played with in machine learning or any other optimization process, um, and then fed back to, to update and interchange without having to reapply Schmernoff rules. Okay. So those have been some underpinnings of how various parts of the open force field ecosystem works. Now we're going to get into some more exciting features and some more tricky upcoming features. So this first notebook is one of these deceptively cool simulations that you can run, a lipid micelle self-assembly. So we're going to take a lipid, disperse it throughout solvent, and then watch as the lipid self-assembles. This notebook is yellow because we're using the Sage force field for lipids, which is not what it's designed for. OpenFF will publish a force field in the future that's designed to work with lipids, but we're not there yet. And also the pack box function that we'll use here is experimental, and we're not sure that we want to continue supporting it. So let us know if you like it. Okay, so we're going to load in a whole bunch of features. Please notice that this, this pack box function is imported from a private module so we're not promising that this will stick around or that it's will continue to work or that its api will remain unchanged everything else is should be fairly familiar at this point okay we're loading a phospholipid called dlpc from an sdf file we're doing this because this sdf file has charges in it um, and so this lets us shortcut our way around having to recalculate the charges on this relatively large molecule. And then we are specifying what concentrations and numbers of different components we want. So we're asking for 100 millimolar salt, 8,000 water molecules, 25 lipids, uh, and a target density of one gram per mil. Then we will load water, sodium, and chloride uh, from smiles. Well, they're assigning them names so that we can visualize them more easily later, and then computing the number of uh, each molecule that we actually want, and the size of the box vectors that we want to use. And then we'll pass that all into the pack box function, and it will spit out a topology with all of these molecules uh, in it. And we can save that topology to a file and visualize it. So we can see lots of lipids all over the place, interspersed by water, no particular structure. They're just all randomly oriented, randomly distributed. Uh, and we'll see if this forms into a micelle in a moment. Okay, so we load the Sage force field. We create an interchange from that force field. And note that we're using this charge from molecules argument. And what that says is, yeah, you can come up with all the charges you like, but I want you, instead of generating the charges for this molecule, I want you to take them from the molecule itself. So this is why this interchange can be created so quickly, because it's not actually having to calculate DLPC's charges. And remember, we stored those charges in the DLPC SDF file. Okay, then we create an OpenMM simulation in the usual way. Energy minimize. Add a barostat because uh, we've just randomly created a system and we're expecting the density to be wrong. Uh, and then add a report to the simulation and we would simulate it. Um, I'm not actually going to run this simulation step because to see this micelle self assembly, you need quite a lot of simulation and 10 nanoseconds is a bit over the top for this demonstration but the prepared trajectory is distributed with these notebooks. So uh, you can run this if you like, or you can just use the trajectory that we used. Okay, so then uh, this backup is the trajectory that's distributed with the notebooks, uh, and so is this PDB file. Uh, but if you'd like to, if you've generated your own versions of those, just swap the comments around here, and then we can visualize. Uh, this is the starting coordinates again. Uh, there's no real structure, but if we play this simulation, 
we can see that the lipids very quickly organize into a micelle. Within 10 nanoseconds, we have this gorgeous micelle with all the fatty lipid tails in the center and the hydrophilic phosphate groups on the outside. Okay, so that's micelle self-assembly. We can also run a simulation on RNA. Now, RNA is a bit tricky because Sage doesn't support RNA, and we've never ported any other RNA force field to the Shmonov system. So there's no way to parameterize RNA in any vaguely reliable way just using OpenFF tools. So what we're going to do instead is demonstrate that interchange doesn't just go forward, it also goes backwards. So interchange can actually take an existing OpenMM system and convert that to an interchange. And then that interchange can be combined with an interchange that's been created in the usual way. With the resulting combined interchange, we can go back to OpenMM. So in this notebook, we will create an RNA simulation in the usual way that OpenMM uses it. Then we'll use interchange to import those parameters. So we'll get the amber RNA parameters from OpenMM into interchange. And then we will combine that with a small molecule that's been parameterized with Sage. Now, a lot of the functions we're using here are experimental, uh, both the from OpenMM functions in interchange and the interchange combining functions are experimental. So we need to create this environment variable that says, I'm happy to use experimental interchange functions because we want to have that really rich chemical information throughout our simulation. We first load molecules from RNA sequence using this short function that creates them from our dkit. So these are two RNA molecules. One is the smallest known ribozyme or uh, ribonucleic enzyme. And the second is the substrate of that ribozyme, which is another RNA molecule. The other substrate of the ribozyme is this phenylalanine adazine monophosphate. So we, we now create this topology uh, from a PDB file that I've already prepared. So this PDB file has salt and water in addition to these three molecules. And we're just saying these are the three molecules. And once that's loaded, we, have, we can visualize it and we see that we have a system with our three molecules. Great. So remember, we can't directly parameterize this with Sage, or rather we can, but we won't get good force field parameters for the RNA because Sage has never been parameterized on RNA. It's a small molecules force field. So the next thing to do is to split this topology up. We pull all of the molecules out into a list and then we pick the two RNA molecules, which are the first two in the topology, because that's how I've designed the topology, and copy the box vectors over to that. And then we do this, the same with the waters, salt, and small molecule. And so we now have two topologies uh, that are disjoint sets of the molecules in our target topology. So we can say, see, here's our sage topology, and you might be able to notice it's got some gaps above and below that small molecule where the RNAs should be. And if I change this to RNA top, we can see that those two RNA molecules are in the same place with the same box vectors. So then we will parameterize the SAGE topology into an interchange in the usual way. So this will involve calculating charges for that small molecule, which will take a moment. And then we uh, can create a OpenMM system in the usual way. So create an OpenMM force field, we convert our RNA topology to an OpenMM topology, and then this will create a system that we can then load back into interchange. Now, one really cool thing that we're doing here is that this interchange is created from an OpenMM system, but it stores an OpenFF topology. And this is nice because OpenMM topologies don't include chemical information. So by using the OpenFF topology here, we keep all of that chemical information and all of the nice features of OpenFF topologies 
that let us combine them, split them up and visualize them. We're creating an interchange from our OpenFF topology, our OpenMM system and the positions that are in the topology. This doesn't look any different to the previous topology, but it now includes the parameters from that OpenMM RNA force field. And now the magic happens, we can combine our Sage interchange with our RNA interchange that we've imported from OpenMM. We get a warning saying that object combination is experimental. And then we can visualize the combined interchange. And again, this just looks like the topology that we started with, but it now has parameters for all of the molecules. Small molecules, water and salt come from SAGE, and the RNAs both come from the amber force field as represented in OpenMM. Now we have an interchange with all of our parameters, we can just simulate it in the usual way and visualize it. So we can have a look at this simulation. RNA, small molecule RNA, and we can watch it jiggle and the different parts of the simulation come together. So this notebook combines RNA parameters from OpenMM inside interchange with Sage parameters to produce a combined simulation system uh, that can be executed in all sorts of engines. The last two notebooks are about a new tool and feature called Naggle. Naggle is a graph neural network for computing charges and maybe one day other properties that are usually computed through quantum chemical calculations. What makes it special is that instead of actually computing a quantum chemical calculation, it trains a neural network to compute some property from a molecular graph. So Nagel is independent of confirmation because it doesn't know confirmations. It just knows there are these atoms, they're connected in these ways, and then calculates charges. So not only are they independent of confirmation, but they actually end up much faster than quantum chemical methods. And they're scaling instead of it being, you know, n to the sixth where n is the number of electrons, they're roughly linear in the number of atoms. At the moment, we're training Nagel to reproduce AM1 BCC charges, but we're not claiming that Nagel is an AM1 BCC method yet. It's Nagel. It produces Nagel charges. And they're numerically very similar to AM1 BCC charges, but we're not yet claiming that they are AM1 BCC charges. So Nagel is an important feature in the future of OpenFF because it means instead of having to wait minutes every time we want to parameterize a new molecule for those charges to be calculated, we can compute them much more quickly. And it also means that we can fit charges to reproduce properties rather than having charges be a fixed point that all the other properties are fit around. This notebook is yellow. It's not quite ready for prime time, but if you're careful, you can probably use it. And that's because Nagel is pre-release and experimental and uh, OpenFF force fields are trained to use A1 BCC charges, not Nagel charges. Okay, so what we're going to do is create a molecule, charge it with A1 BCC, then charge it with Nagel and compare them. So this is Linezolid which is a reserve antibiotic for multi-drug resistant gram-positive infections. That's what it looks like. And the toolkit includes Nagel Toolkit Wrapper, which works just the way, just the same way as the OpenEye RD kit and Abitools Toolkit Wrappers, but it wraps Nagel for charge calculations. We can ask the Toolkit Wrapper what its supported charge methods are. And we can see that there's an early alpha of AM1 BCC charges and then two release candidates. So we'll ask for the second release candidate. And uh, because Nagel is a machine learning method, the first time you run it, it takes a little second to compile. 
So here we import the Nagel Toolkit wrapper. We create a toolkit registry using Nagel Toolkit instead of Amber Tools, and then with RD Kit and the built-in toolkit wrapper. And then we will create a molecule and assign partial charges. And it's done in 116 milliseconds. So here are those partial charges that were computed by Nagel. If we do the same thing with Amber Tools, which is the open source uh, toolkit we use to compute AM1 BCC charges at the moment, Still going. Still going. There we go. Same molecule, Nagel can charge in a tenth of a second. Amber Tools takes 40 seconds. And we can see the charges produced by Amber Tools here. Okay, so let's compare them. Here we'll just produce a plot of the Nagel charges against uh, A1 BCC charges. We can see they span the gamut from about minus a half up to about one, and all of the charges are dead on this line. If they were exactly the same, they would be on this line, and most of them are identical. The differences between these charges are extremely small. So it's 500 times faster and gives essentially the same answers. And we can see that in another way by looking at the differences between them. And so this is the difference between the charge of each atom with each method. And you can see the largest difference is 0 0.03 elementary charges. For reference, that's pretty similar to the difference between different implementations of AM1BCC. Uh, and we, if you are interested in which atom th these are, they look like they're atoms 18 and 20, which are these two carbons on either side of this oxygen bridge. Okay, so Nagel, fast, gives the same answers. Um, what can we do with this? This last notebook is red, and that's because we're going to use Nagel in a place that it's definitely not appropriate. Where is it definitely not appropriate? In charging a full protein with a non-canonical amino acid. One day, Nagel will be a part of our force fields and this will be extremely appropriate. This is one of the reasons that we're developing Nagel so that we can seamlessly combine different chemistries into the same molecule. But at the moment, our protein force field uses amber charges. They're quite different to Nagel charges. And so you should be careful uh, and probably not use this method. But the point is, even though this will not give you a self-consistent force field, it demonstrates how powerful this technique will be once we have a Nagel compatible protein force field. So we are going to load a protein with a modified residue and then charge it with Nagel and run a simulation on it. So as I've said, it's red because Nagel is experimental and pre-release uh, because Sage parameters haven't been trained for use in non-canonical amino acids, and most importantly, because FF14SB has very different charges to the charges that are produced by Nagel. Okay, so this is our uh, combined system. So it has a protein, solvent, and uh, that protein has been post-translationally modified. This is a part of a protein that I was using in my PhD. You can see it's a binding protein. Um, binding site's just here. And it has this, uh, this fluorescent dye conjugated to a thiol group. Uh, so I would have loved this uh, during my PhD, but too soon. So the first thing we need to do is tell the OpenFF toolkit how to load a non-canonical amino acid. And we have a nice little experimental API for this, which is called uh, additional substructures. 
what we do is we create a molecule with our substructure. You can see here, this is a, again, a cysteine uh, residue stuck onto a dye. And then the atoms that are not a part of this particular residue are placed in as well. Um, and we've labeled them as francium because sage doesn't have francium in it. And so if this gets left behind somehow, we'll get uh, a clear error. Then we just need to mark each atom as either part of the substructure or not. And this lets us define the bond order between this substructure and the remainder of the molecule without including an entire molecule. So uh, we just go through, find all the atoms called francium, and then say they're not part of the substructure and everything else is part of the substructure. Then we use our familiar topology.fromPDB file, but instead of using unique molecules, we pass in our additional substructure, which it just adds to the list of amino acid residues. And then we can visualize it in the usual way. And there we go. So there's our OpenFF topology with our new die. Okay, next step, we're gonna compute some partial charges. Now, this notebook in a previous life had a long, complicated series of steps where we broke the residue out that we wanted to charge and then we capped it and we ran it through a charge method and pulled those charges out and calculated a, a smokes for it and wrote library charges for it. And then we could put all of that together into a new force field for that uh, parameter. Nagel makes that way simpler. Instead of doing all that work, we just run the whole protein through Nagel. So this is just the same code we saw in the last notebook. We figure out what Nagel model we want to use. We pull the protein out of the topology, and then we assign the protein's partial charges. And there's a lot of partial charges, but that's it. So in 30 seconds, which is less time than it would take just to charge that residue with a traditional method, we can Nagel charge the entire protein. We now have consistent charges for the entire protein. Note, they're not consistent with the force field we're using, but they're consistent with each other. Okay, we can quickly compare these Nagel charges with uh, what the force field would otherwise produce. So this just produces a, a new force field that gives every atom a library charge of zero. And we include that as the first force field before amber. And then we know if there's any molecules that haven't been assigned a charge by this, uh, they're not included in amber. Then we can go over everything and identify the charges that are actually part of the dye. And we can plot the Nagel charges for the remainder of the protein against the amber charges. And we can see that this is a lot less consistent than the last one. And that's because Nagel is not trying to reproduce these charges. It, it's trying to reproduce um, A and 1BCC charges and FF14SB doesn't use A and 1BCC charges. We can see some cool things. These clusters uh, each represent like a particular atom in a particular residue. And we can see they've been smeared out a little bit. And we think this is because Nagel is actually taking some uh, influence from neighboring residues to charge each residue. So that's that's promising. And if you're interested, we can break down the assigned charges from by atom and residue name. I'm not gonna do that because it's a very long, complicated graph, but um, the code's there if you'd like to dig into it. So now we load the uh, Sage FF14SB force field, which is just the combination of Sage and that Amber force field. We create an interchange from it, very carefully remembering to use this charge from molecules argument that we used earlier to get charges from an SDF file. We're now getting them from the protein, which stores the Nagel charges. So this should be relatively quick because it's no longer calculating any charges, although it is assigning a force field to a large system, so it's not super fast. And then we just do the usual thing to convert it to an open AM simulation, simulate and visualize it. So here's our Nagel charged protein. Our dye is here. Let's uh, center on that. 
And let's have a look. There it is, wiggling away. So this is really as easy as it can be to produce a non-canonical amino acid system for MD, right? Like you just run it through the usual system. This will be exactly how it works in a future version of OpenFF. So there'll be a future version of OpenFF with the protein force field that's either uses Naggle charges or uses charges that are compatible with Naggle. And you'll put a protein with non-canonical amino acids into it and it will use protein specific parameters where they exist, it'll fall back everywhere else, and then it'll charge the whole thing uh, with Naggle. Now, I'm really excited about this. So if you'd like to dig more into OpenFF tools, please take a look at our docs page. Um, today we've just gone through a bunch of different little examples of things you can do now with OpenFF tools and things you'll be able to do in the future. Uh, so I hope that's really whet your appetite and you're excited about what we're doing. Links are all in the description. Notebook Links to notebooks uh, that we ran are in the description. Check out the other workshops we ran this year in, on our YouTube page. And yeah, hope you enjoyed.